Welcome everyone. My name is Annette Grishow. I am Professor of Architecture and Philosophy and Director of the Bachelor of Design. It's really my great honour today to uh, share this discussion. I'll introduce our wonderful um, Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, Melbourne School of Design students shortly. But before I do launch in, I want to acknowledge the original custodians on whose unceded lands we're gathered today, on whose lands we live and think and work. I pay my respects to the Wurundjeri warrior of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge their elders, past and present. And I acknowledge the place of Indigenous learning in the academy. We have so much to learn. So it's really great to be here today. We're looking at the role of gender in the architecture school, gender and pedagogy. And I'm joined by Yazira Musa, who's a graduate of the MSD, Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And I'm joined by Stephanie Guest, who's a current student. In fact, Stephanie's undertaking her master's design thesis with myself and Virginia Mannering over here. And we're joined by Sophie Adset, who is currently a student here, as well as one of the curators of this really extraordinary exhibition called Matrix, which of course is about this archive of feminist activist architectural work looking for the place of women and other minority identities. Maybe we need to unpack that a little bit. Um, and their place in the city. Their argument being that the city has not been made an inviting place for us. You know, the cover of the fabulous, famous Matrix um, book with the woman having to kind of handle that pram up and down those sort of underground steps. Just simple spatial blind spots such as these which make everyday life for women, children, minority groups, uh, differently abled bodies, intersectional identities challenging. We've carefully kind of planned a series of questions today and one version of the series of questions we could call a feminist shit sandwich or a bruschetta. We want to start with something which was a term that, um, yeah, Virginia introduced to me, the bruschetta, so it makes it sound slightly more gourmet. Um, we want to start from a really powerful position. I'm going to ask each of our wonderful people here to um, situate their practices in terms of becoming architects. Talk about this perhaps through, you know, their attitude to um, a feminist approach as critical feminist thinkers to speak of their experience. Um, and that's we're gonna, where we're going to launch in. And then we're going to ask some difficult questions and then we're hoping to conclude with some really optimistic, joyful reflections on possible futures. So that's the direction we're going to take. And um, also we thought some... You know, we're using these large terms like feminism or, importantly, intersectionality, which extends beyond the representation of women and includes a diversity of gender, class, sex, ethnicity, race, differently abled bodies and so forth, um, you know, expanding out from um, feminist praxis into all these different positions. We thought it would be really valuable to unpack some of the terminology first. And so I might even just start by handing over to Sophie, who's got some neat definitions that we can hold in the back of our minds as we're proceeding into the discussion today. Cool. Thanks, Helen. Um, a definition I default to and one that I've used for the parlour reading room, which I did with Anwen Hocking a few years ago, is that um, when we're talking about feminism, we refer to Bell Hook's definition which is the movement to end sexism, sexual exploitation and sexual oppression, which cannot be separated from racism and from how the present is shaped by colonial histories. And I think that has a lot of relevancy in Australia as well. To kind of also quote Flavia Zodin, our feminism will be intersection, ex intersectional or it will be bullshit, um, which is a nice strong reminder. Um, my feminist practice... Um, in architecture is, I think, ever-evolving. Um, it's one that I still haven't quite figured out, but I guess it's kind of always applying a, a feminist critique to the systems I am taught under, the ones I work within, and the work that I do myself. And so I guess this exhibition is one of those kind of studies um, and explorations of how we curate a feminist exhibition and how that actual process also 
kinds of aligns with those ideas. And I think that extends to, yeah, my output at, at university as far as I can push it, which I think we'll come back to. Um, to what extent can you kind of practice in those ways in an institution? And, yeah, and I think it also extends to a personal, your personal life, um, your engagement with people and communities around you and ideas um, and not siloing yourself either and kind of always exploring um, how you interact with the world with curiosity. Thanks so much for that. So we could kind of follow through with Stephanie and ask you to kind of situate your practices, um, whether under a feminist lens or, you know. Hmm. Sure. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. We weren't sure <laughs> if anyone would be here. So it's very nice to see you. I guess my uh, experience of architecture school is completely entangled with my experience of becoming a mother, which was a sort of accidental decision. Um, I just started architecture school in Sydney at UTS and a month later became accidentally pregnant and for lots of complicated reasons decided to go ahead with that pregnancy and that baby is now nearly seven and she came to my class the other day, um, school holidays. So I think like architecture school for me is also like parenting school and learning how to be a parent while also being a student and I'm taking a really long time to finish this degree. I'm now doing the 300 point masters and I started that here when Mabel was one and I've subsequently had another baby who's nearly two. So I think when I finish this degree at the end of the year, I'm going to have a big cry about the way that my children's lives have been really in the shadow of architecture school. And I think everything I've done at architecture school is through that lens of how hard it is to be a parent and a student, how hard it is to be at architecture school as a mother, um, recognizing how, how my spatial experience is affected by either becoming very large, you know, and not fitting through smaller spaces or having a small human who, you know, can't get around, you know, or needing to use a pram or needing to use a parent's room, which is what my work in this exhibition is about. And sort of this realisation that, oh, these rooms are shunted into the depths of buildings. They're not prioritised and they ended up, they end up isolating people who need to express milk, which is something that I do in the basement here every now and then. Um, or people who need to bring their babies with them and change a nappy somewhere. So I think, yeah, my whole experience of architecture school and my practice is very much about that experience. And I've ended up designing for my children in some of my subjects. And I think in my thesis, there'll be a parent's room making an appearance. So I think that's, that's the way I situate my practice. Thank you, Stephanie. Yazira, how do you situate your practice? Um... I am a recent graduate, so I'm in practice now. And I can't say that, you know, being an employee at an architecture practice is my kind of situated ideal of feminist praxis, but um, I'm really just, I think most of my architecture career has just been trying to work out how I fit into place and how I think I've always been fascinated by this idea that you, you as an architect are tasked with um, deciding what a space needs. And I think a feminist praxis of architecture is really critically unpacking that and saying who gets to say what a place needs, who gets to say who is in that place, who has been in that place previously, what that place is. And that's what my work in the exhibition was. It was kind of an elective subject that I did with Karen, which I was so grateful to do. It was probably the only theory subject that I did in my entire degree that had an actually diverse reading list, a critical reading list and a political reading list. It kind of interrogated class. It looked at the, you know, coloniality of the city, which I think is increasingly in the syllabus, but at in my experience, that was the first time that was engaged with in a very rigorous way. 
And so as part of that elective, I was trying to prepare myself for my thesis because I was like, well, in half a year's time, I'm gonna have to be the person who says, this is what the world needs. And I, I didn't really figure that out. <laughs> but it kind of, I think, I think the best thing architecture school ever gave me was criticality, which is not the knowledge that I came out with, but the instinct to always ask how knowledge is produced and who it's produced by and who it's produced for. And I think a, a feminist praxis of architecture is a critical practice of architecture. Great, love it. Critical practices of architecture with a feminist lens. While you are here, all of you, as a recent graduate, you can speak to that past experience, but both of you now in the school, to what extent did you feel like you were adequately represented as women or, you know, other diverse identities? We can think through a whole transsectional sort of lens of diverse identities. How far did you see yourself represented in leadership, in course material and through the citational practices? We've heard a bit about citational practices from you in this school. I think times have changed since 2018 when I started the 300 point masters and I'm looking at Karen here because she knows this story but I made a formal complaint actually to Julie Willis um, because in my first semester of the 300 point masters we had all male teachers and the syllabus really I don't think included any women. Um, I raised that with my lecturers who were unmoved I would say. Um, and it was quite disheartening because, yeah, I couldn't see how I could fit into the university. All of my tutors were men um, and it was pretty, uh, yeah, I think I couldn't see that I would really continue. <laughs> um, we made a complaint and I believe that has changed now to an extent. And then thankfully I did Karen's subject in the second semester which completely transformed that. And I think as I've moved through this degree, which has taken me many years now, I've learned that you have to seek out people and that if you look for them, they are there. They're just maybe not the iconic studio people. Um, and I've found, I have found subjects where there are really strong women leading them and doing really wonderful critical work. But I feel like I have to, really seek them out and it comes from a lot of conversations with fellow students and a lot of unlearning of what I don't you know good architectural work looks like and I still find myself second guessing my own drawings because we have you know Mies van der Rohe has been implanted in my brain and it's really hard to unlearn that. I would say the same. Um, I had to seek out tutors and professors who I know would give me something I could relate to or think about in a different way. But again, that comes with, I think, a really um, privileged position of like having a community to ask, to having the time to find those things out, to even be aware that that's a problem in my own education. And then in saying that, it's still mostly white women. And so, you know, there's there's a whole lot of other parts of the community that are still missing in education. You see them hopefully represented on the walls here, but not necessarily teaching. So, yeah, I've encountered feminist practice and discussions around colonial histories, but I haven't really engaged with, um, like, disability or looking at gender binary so much. Um, so there's, there's only so much you can seek out. And again, it puts the um, responsibility on the individual. And I was lucky to have the headspace to even deal with that um, and really access a community. Um, I've been at Melbourne on off for 10 years. So I knew kind of who to ask and um, where to look. Um, and I, I think that I think not everyone has that ability to do that. It can feel really um, sacrilegious to question certain things. And I remember when I met you, Sophie, um, last semester, we had this conversation in the atrium that felt like, oh, my God, we're going to be put in architecture school jail or something for 
critiquing certain people, like certain teachers, certain drawing styles, certain classmates. And it was so refreshing <laughs> because I think there's a certain amount of um, worshipping that goes on and uh, there's not a lot of people that have the courage to call that out. And it was just, yeah, it was really refreshing because I'd never had that kind of conversation before about the kinds of drawings that get privileged, the kinds of studios that get to exhibit in certain rooms. Yeah, it was kind of shocking to me and it kind of made me realise how brainwashed I'd been as well. <laughs> um, I'm still still processing that as we come into the final submission for thesis. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, I would echo all of those things. Um, I, I don't think I've been taught by a single non-white person through my whole master's degree and maybe that's on me for the subjects that I chose but I think similarly it was really hard to find there was one subject where I knew it was it was the only it was the only kind of theoretical subject looking it was a Noma Perez's modernism in Asia and that was all I could find and it was in uh, on a semester that I couldn't take it because it clashed with my thesis and so I think it's there's there's a huge lack but even so as you know there's there's a slow pace for structural change perhaps you could argue that but I think even in those subjects that you do have that are taught by perhaps a hegemonic group of people the citational practices can be more diverse the um, precedents that you're offered can be more diverse the um, just the kind of crux of what architecture is and where it comes from and situating that in the everyday is sorely lacking and I think is why this is such an alienating space for so many people. I look at, um, I always romanticize planning and I feel like some planning people can tell me how wrong I am, but planning seems like people actually talk about the world in a way that's accessible to folks who have you know, not been to Venice or not looked at pictures of Venice for their whole lives, you know? It's like, I could explain this to my parents and they would see the value in what I'm doing rather than being like, okay, so you just found out that this is ugly and this is actually good? Cool. <laughs> All right, yes. Uh, taste systems, implicit taste systems and value systems embedded in what we learn. I think, uh, you know, Steph, you're also drawing attention to this with this expression of the iconic studio. So certain privileged places of learning where I'm just gonna assume that you might be talking of something like a master slave, master apprentice model in which maybe students aren't invited to offer a critical response to what's happening or else students might not even be aware that they can ask questions. So this comes really centrally into this idea of um, pedagogies that we're discussing here. Uh, and perhaps leads into the next question that we've begun to venture to. How then from a feminist standpoint or an intersectional standpoint, can we speak truth to power from the position of a student? This is certainly hard to do. How do we ask questions of those spaces in which we feel there's um, uh, disproportionate privilege or exclusivity at work or a certain dogma being imposed? How do you do that as students? How do you find the courage? Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's, as I said before, it comes back to the individual having a certain privilege in their confidence and that their voice will be listened to. I think there's a lot of power in students informing each other. Um, and something that I have tried to do, um, my entire degree, um, of, and I also tutor in, in first year, kind of giving people access to information of like, you can underload um, you, it isn't okay to have class on a Saturday just because you're in lockdown. So kind of actually, it's, it's kind of that thing of like when you're in an environment that is actually potentially quite traumatic, um, you kind of can't see it. And so when you talk to people outside, sometimes they can affirm for you that actually what you're feeling is not okay. For those who have the ability to speak about power and question power, to kind of bring that to the community. Um, and it's a collegial experience. Um, and kind of empower others. 
um, through conversation and as we've said, like sharing knowledge about who to do studio under or, um, you know, who's a really great teacher. Um, and that's how I found a lot of um, my great teachers is through that community. Um, so it's kind of bottom up grassroots, but there's a lot of power and potential in that. Um, yeah. I've tried, I've tried the formal roots and it doesn't always go very well. There was a group of us who, who met with Julie Willis back in 2018 and I, I do believe that change was implemented after that. Um, I don't think the first semester of 300 point is all male. I don't know. Do you have, I don't know if anyone here is 300 point, but I think it's changed. Um, but I've had really negative experiences bringing things up formally. I feel like I've been shut down. Um, I feel like my personal information about why I needed special consideration has not been treated in a sensitive way. And I think a certain administrator in this building has way too much information about my personal mm. life and my own mental health, which scares me. Um, but I do feel like, you know, thesis at least for me has been really different. Um, and, but again, that's because I've sought people out, you know, and I made sure to have a meeting with the senior tutor before semester began to lay it all out, like, here's what I'm going to need from you and who should I have studio with? And because I had experience with you as a teacher as well, knowing that you're fundamentally just kind and understanding and that that's a quality that's not always there, you know? So I think it hasn't been easy to speak truth to power um, and it's figuring out which power you could actually speak to. Um, <laughs> And I think it's also recognising that so many of the people we interact with in our degree are casual tutors who have no job security. And so you can't actually expect them to be able to do anything to help the situation, that they are also protecting their own time. And I think that's sometimes where things can go really wrong is maybe expecting your tutor to be able to do something that they can't. So I've also started to seek out people that have permanent roles because I know that they actually have more power, you know, and yeah. I or at don't, least I don't, they're less vulnerable for sure. They're less vulnerable, yeah. So I think I'll actually feel great relief when I finish this degree <laughs> because it does, feel, it does feel like there are some things that are just too hard um, and it's like a way of, yeah, w worming your way through. Um, as safely as you can. Um, yeah, I would echo what Sophie talked about. I guess in my experience, a lot has come down to who I've been able to talk to and get information from. And I think something to add to that is it can be quite difficult to find a community to share that information with in this school and um, even amongst students as much as we have each other's back perhaps more than the uh, faculty, um, there are still kind of the ways that class and gender and, um, you know, all kinds of things play into how easy it is to connect with students and how a kind of like cool group of students really easily forms in design spaces. But yeah, I also wanted to shout out um, Fatima, who's, and sorry, I've Okay, Sarah, who have started a group called um, Taking Up Space, and they kind of operate every month or so for um, people of color, female and non-binary people of color in the um, school students to get together and kind of commune. And I feel like th these kinds of informal spaces where people can get together over some kind of shared identity or experience to have these conversations is necessary and it takes people to feel that lack and to kind of make it happen. Um, and so I think that that stuff really helps. Even if you're not gonna go speak truth to power, you'll, you'll have kind of people to commune with. 
Yeah, I'm hearing a lot about the really incredible support systems of peer-to-peer learning and just sharing of experiences. And, you know, peer-to-peer learning is meant to be one of the most powerful forms of learning anyway. I mean, you could get rid of us professors and tutors and so forth and just do your work together and we're kind of like epiphenomenon really. We should remember that occasionally. Um, But it's really great to hear that at least even though it's been this challenging process to find it, that that's something that... Uh, you have secured but I'm also hearing a lot about the struggle so you know I think we can probably fairly squarely locate ourselves in the Australian context in a neoliberal university system uh, where students as we know for a while now have been less figured as students than customers or users or clients Is it increasingly hard to even identify as a student, given all of life's demands, given the fact that rent is impossible, cost of living post-pandemic is so hard? Um, What is it to be a student today? And um, this too, I think, probably leads us back to issues of how we manage mental health and how we care for each other as well. But um, do you see yourselves as students and do you value that as a position in society? I'm just really interested to know. I see myself as a student um, (laughs) because I'm not working full time and yeah, I mean it does impact my ability to support my family, like I can't afford the childcare that I need to be here. So my parents are paying for that, which is like such a huge privilege to have parents that are willing to do that because at the start of this year I thought I can't actually finish this degree because it's prohibitively expensive. Um, so yeah, my parents value education and they have that money, but without that, I just probably wouldn't finish the degree. So I do feel like a student because I know how lucky I am to be here and to have some time to study, although I am working. I have, yeah, I'm sort of imagining next year when I will be looking for a full-time job and grieving a little bit because I love being a student as well, like as much as I think I'll feel liberated to finish, I recognise how how free you are as a student in some sense because you can explore ideas outside of commercial consideration to an extent. Um, Yeah, I feel like a student, but I feel like a disgruntled student (laughs) who, you know, has lots of things to say about, yeah, my um, nearly 70-something grand student debt. So, yeah, I feel like a very disgruntled student customer person. Um, I think I'm always going to be a student. (laughs) I think that's just what's going to happen for me. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting question because we are mostly customers. We're paying for an education, which is a service in a way. And sometimes it helps me to remember that to ask for things I want. Mm. Because you hear of like there's subjects where you, I think at other universities, you do a subject to work in a practice for free, but you're paying the uni to do that. And those kinds of subjects um, kind of show, well, I'm the one paying, where is my voice being heard? Can't I, if, if I'm paying, can't I be shaping what I'm being taught? But yeah, it's hard, I think, um, As a local student, you have a lot more access to help from the government, which still doesn't give you that much help, but you can underload. So there's ways in which, as a local student, I think you can kind of get through university, takes a lot longer, um, but you can just about manage. Um, I can't imagine how hard it is for international students who can't work, who don't get youth allowance um, and have to do their degree in two years. Um, So I feel like a lucky student in that way that at least we're being educated in a country that we have some support. Yeah, so I I think I'm always going to be a student in some capacity in the sense that I just love learning. Um, uh, But sometimes it's nice to go, oh, well, I'm a customer too, for some reasons. (laughs) (laughs) I think being a student is a huge privilege it's um, it's difficult because you can see the uni kind of shift and not be sure. It feels like there's a kind of uncertainty of whether we're being trained for employment or whether we are, you know, in those 
in that kind of old spirit of the university being trained to think. Um, and I think both of those are valid because some people do really just want to come through and get a job and, um, and, and other people are here for some kind of like intellectual, um, a, a kind of broader project of becoming an intellectual. And I think it would be great if there was a little bit more honesty around both of those career trajectories. As a student, it feels like you're here to learn and you he learn theory and you learn certain design skills, but you don't actually learn about what your career trajectory might look like either as an academic or as a practitioner or as um, you know the miscellaneous third space that is always being celebrated or more recently is being celebrated, but the funding structures for um, these ways of practicing are really opaque. Um, or I guess the, the future of being an academic is not opaque. The future of being an academic is very transparently precarious. None of that information is offered explicitly. You've got to kind of claw for it. Mm. And I think that is a difficult part of being a student and maybe a quite a um, confronting part of n when you finally finish studying. Oh, I think you've drawn attention to a really important tension embedded right in the midst of especially architecture school, the vocational thrust or a kind of critically engaged broader intellectual project. Does it have to be an either or? You'd really hope that the practices we learn in this space we can take into uh, the profession of architecture and the built environment professions and make a positive change. My experience here uh, since returning from Sweden, which of course is a very different sort of social setup, though increasingly becoming neoliberalised too, um, my experience here has been, um, I've been very surprised at a lot of marketing speak that's used for everyday things. Like it's important to get the student numbers to make the money. And, you know, and um, sometimes the question of education gets lost in the midst of that. And then there's often the kind of increasingly with research, it's about being hooked into industry. Okay, go and get the money from industry, collaborate with industry. There's such a push to um, do that work in linkage with industry. And as though to say, you follow what industry wants rather than actually, what about the other way around? you graduate from the School of Architecture and you have an impact on industry and changes what it thinks it needs, you know. We don't, it seems to me, speak enough about how our graduating students are critically equipped to kind of enter practice and change it from within. Is there a powerful potential for that? Do you feel like you can make a change exiting school and slowly, incrementally shifting the value systems of industry and practice? Is that possible? Yeah, you're, you're, you're the one who has the closest experience to this and you just said you feel like a bit of a wage slave, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was a joke. Um, can you say the question again? Sorry. Yeah, no, so what's the question? Can, can a graduating student exit into the profession and feel that they can transform industry and the profession gradually? Can they speak into that space and bring their knowledge and ask questions of industry and its norms and its value systems? Do you feel like you can make a change there? I think certainly people are making change and people are finding ways to practice within these, uh, you know, alternative funding models because our industry is tied to real estate. Mm. And so our industry is tied to the developer model to kind of the ruins of late capitalism. But I think... Um, as much as people can collectivize and shift the balance of power in certain ways. When we talk about pedagogy or university, the biggest lack is that you don't, you don't spend much time thinking about that. We, we aren't actually trained to think about economy and you know, the, the way things work. Um, you know, you do a studio and you're the developer, the architect and the client. And as much as I don't think you need to be designing within the framework of, you know, this would be a viable, um, you know, feasible economic development, 
if you are to do something utopian, I think you should also be aware of why, it, what would be standing in the way of that thing becoming a reality and what might be the ways to, to chip away at that. Mm. I think that is a kind of huge, um, hugely missing thing in our, in our kind of training. Okay. Um, and, you know, knowing if we can't make money the way architects typically make money, what else can we do? You know? Really good question. Maybe we could return to this highly privileged space of the design studio, which is at the centre of any architect's or becoming architect's educational experience, likewise in the other design disciplines. What are the ways learning from feminist and intersectional theories and practices might, meet, might we radically transform that space? Um, you know, even myself uh, in the teaching that I do in that space, I'm full of doubt about whether what tends or always risks to be a very linear approach to gradually incrementally uh, producing a refined project as though such a thing would be possible in 12 to 15 weeks is the best way. Sometimes I wonder whether we shouldn't be sitting down in studio and just like sharing experiences and going on walks and radically realigning what it is that we do together. But I'm, I'm interested to know, like, if you could come into the space of sort of designing a design studio for pedagogical purposes, what do you think are the kinds of things we should bring into there with this sort of, you know, investing in this feminist intersectional ethos? Um, well, break down the binaries, right? So not have such a hierarchical nature of the studio, which then, going back to your previous question as well, I think a huge issue is you get to industry and you don't feel empowered. You don't feel like your voice matters at all because you've already kind of done your whole education under a director, master kind of figure. Um, so breaking down that binary for sure and perhaps working collectively on a project I think Mary Featherston did a talk here last night and was talking about how, um, is it the Emilio Reggio system for primary schools? They whole kind of year levels work on a project together collaboratively over the year. And that's what you kind of do in practice. So perhaps it's less focus on the individual outcomes and more on the group outcomes. Um, and then from that you, under, you get to learn a whole lot of different people's experiences in life and how they view the world. And, you know, you can you go on walks and start to interpret the built environment in your different ways. Yeah, I love that idea. And uh, this is a conversation I've been having with one of my friends and peers in the Design Thesis Project. But, you know, not all of us are super quick rhino modelers but some of us are good writers or researchers or whatever else. And it would be really nice to be in a project where you didn't have to be everything, you know, like um, that you could do the things that you actually like doing or want to do. Like I'm, it was a very helpful conversation um, the other day with my friend. I'm feeling very much out of my depth at the moment because I'm not the best rhino modeler and I'm not the best renderer or anything like that, but I am a strong, I think, researcher and writer. And it would be really nice, to, I, my career is never gonna be one where they say, Stephanie, quickly model that up in Rhino, please. <laughs> or shoot us out some renders of that or whatever. But they, I hope that I have a job where I am doing a lot of research and writing and thinking about the concept. So why couldn't I sort of hone those skills even further rather than pretend that I'm making adequate renders, which you won't see a render from me this semester. That's fine. Um, I think you should go, go <laughs> it, go dig deeper, do it. But I think it's, it's too much almost to expect that we should be able to do all of that within one project. And I think that's where for me, like I've lost a lot of confidence in certain studios because I'm not that student turning up with the lovely, not overly commercial looking renders you know, the just right renders that certain people are able to produce. And that I have noticed that my confidence has been eroded in some of those studios where I have to sort of forget certain images or forget the praise that certain images has been given to kind of remind myself, like, no, I'm a strong student. 
but it, it definitely has affected my confidence. And so I think like if we could do a year long project where we said, this is the role that I want to have, you know, I'm going to be the architectural narrative designer for this project. Mm, nice. um, and we kind of almost wrote our own job descriptions and then worked as a collective team. That would be really fun and I think inspiring. Ooh, great, getting some good tips here. <laughs> Um, I'm going to share something that I wrote down because I've been reading Bell Hooks. I've been reading Teaching to Transgress. And there's a quote here that I think like relates to everything we've been talking about, which is, as a classroom community, our capacity to generate excitement is deeply affected by our interest in one another, in hearing one another's voices, in recognizing one another's presence. And then another kind of thought, which is if design theory claims where all designers creating preferred situations, there are going to be as many modes of design as there are preferred situations. And so I think this opportunity to be working collectively is also an opportunity for a lot of conflict because it's an opportunity to actually engage with our difference, which doesn't happen a lot in architecture school where all, um, it's that thing of like cultivating good taste or good or like the correct knowing the correct rules when actually you and I can want really different outcomes and both of those are really valid because they reflect our positionality and those conversations would be much more um, generative than anything uh, than anything we can produce individually and then I think that comes into that role of the of the tutor or the the lecturer or the whatever um, <laughs> which you talked about being almost, um, you know, uh, less important than the collective work of the students. But I actually think that is the most critical role in a situation of uh, a collective project because you can facilitate a certain tenor of conversations. You can provide the resources that people need in order to collectively organize for possibly the first time. Um, and so it becomes an ecosystem, a highly risky ecosystem for everyone involved. And it takes a lot more work than I think what most casual tutors are paid for. Mm. But I think that would be a genuinely exciting and generative space to learn in. And to add to that, to then de-individualize the course and not put grades front and center. Oh yeah. Right? So. So there's group work that already exists, right? But it's Which so... Which can be terrible. <laughs> it's so tense because you have different expectations of grades as well of what you want to achieve and people then kind of expect different levels of work from each other. So, like, then I guess, like, to add to that is how do you then structurally kind of enable students to feel like they can work with their colleagues rather than can compete with their peers? Mm. Mm. Really great questions. I think we're at the moment in the panel where it might be nice to open up and see whether people have comments, questions, things that they'd like to say. We do have a roaming microphone. Um, so if you want to add something or ask questions, um, please use that uh, because we are recording this session. Um, so you're all really welcome. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from you questions for the panel or comments about your experience as students or practitioners. Um, hi, I'm Simrat. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation because a few weeks ago um, there was an exhibition that was happening by Anoma um, and that was the first time I actually saw a lot of Southeast Asian women all together in the atrium. And um, I've been, I did my bachelor's here. I worked for a little bit and now I'm doing my master's and I've never been taught by a woman, except for maybe one in first year. And that wasn't even a studio. Um, I teach now to um, undergrad students and I can, and I've, you know, if I reflect back, um, and also, like, because I'm Indian, there's a lot of international students that, you know, from my observation, I feel like they come up to me and actually ask questions they feel like they have um, 
they have the ability to come and talk to because they see someone similar. And I feel the same way when I see people, it doesn't just have to be someone, um, someone for color, but like a woman, you know, because we all have different experiences, but to be, to have that visual experience, to have that visual representation really does make a big difference. Um, and I really agree with a lot of the points you all raised because I feel like um, at the exhibition as well, when I started talking, when I heard that other people who are in the positions of, you know, permanent full-time positions of, you know, academia, having these sort of opinions um, that I usually have in my own head, but I have actually, I've never, you know, voiced them out. Um, but to be able to hear them and feel validated was quite empowering for me because I went back and, you know, I had so many conversations with my friends and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, so it really makes a lot of difference. And I don't think I ever realized, you know, you keep hearing all these buzzwords, you know, people of color representation, but you, you know, that's quite important and feminism is quite important, but I never realized how important, what difference it makes um, in your everyday life when it actually happens to you. And that was my light bulb moment. Um, so, and I think events like these and exhibitions like these does do make a lot of difference as well. And I, I really would want to see more of this and be a part of this because there is so much work that the building produces and a lot of that is done by women, but we're actually quite invisible. It's often taken over by, you know, um, stronger voices. Another point would probably be like Julie Willis. She's, you know, the head of, you know, uh, head of the building. But I never, like, there's a lack of representation there as well. I never see her. I only see her once. And she's such a strong woman. She's done so much incredible work. So, yeah, I I, 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 that's my end comment. I think representation is actually quite important. It does make a lot of difference. A really key term, no doubt. And in fact, we were just talking about the role of representation earlier in the week when we had a panel um, of uh, design thesis students speaking to their projects, uh, which were looking at design with a gender agenda. And representation came up as this really key term in terms of the visibility of women in leadership. So uh, women who represent that role, and we can see that this is something we might aspire to, but also representation as the way in which we manage our media, draw, what modes of representation are we using? And to be aware that that's kind of like packed with ideology and we see that there's a lot of dogma embedded in that. And then also how we represent ourselves to each other from our situated positions and validate that experience and share that with others. And I think you've spoken beautifully actually to all of these definitions. So th thanks so much for these comments. Um, hi, thank you for the discussion. Uh, my name is Taisia. Uh, I just have a comment that I wanted to add to um, the question of what does the architecture school actually prepare you to do and empowers you to do? And um, I don't think that's an original opinion. I've heard it several times throughout my, just my master's degree, but um, it seems that the, the workload and the quality of work that expected of you as um, like an H1 student is unhealthy in a way that you're, if you want to be a high achiever and if you're studying full time, which is very relevant to um, international students, um, as you can't underload, um, and you end up with this work environment where you're just constantly like on the verge of mental breakdown and like really putting all your wishes, all your mental health stuff on hold, but then you're released into the industry and somehow you're expected to advocate for healthy work environments. I feel like ideally, architecture school or any school um, that should empower you to actually kind of take, take care of yourself long term and not just be this like star that's going to shine bright and then burn out and then quit the industry and not have any. Yeah. 
So that's just the comment that I wanted to add. No, absolutely. And a really important one. And it might be an opportunity for me too to alert you to the fact that I think hopefully shortly there'll be a survey that will be um, circulated amongst all students in the school based on um, Australia Research Council um, research that um, Naomi Steady is undertaking into the wellbeing of architects. So she's asked our school if we can circulate a survey to students about their... Um, their attitude to sort of their well-being and mental health as they're studying um, in architecture schools. So look out for that because it might be a place in which you get to kind of offer some really great feedback to the wonderful work that Naomi Stead's doing. I've got a feeling we might be drawing to a close. Yes, I'm getting the nod. So I think I just really love to thank um, this wonderful panel of powerful women I have so much admiration for all of you. Like, it's such a pleasure to be sitting here with you. I feel really honoured. So let's totally put our hands together for the great panel. And thank you, Elaine, for being here. I think it's really helpful for us as students also to know that there are powerful women in the faculty who will grant extensions, you know, who won't treat you like you don't care about architecture if your whole life isn't about architecture school. So, yeah, thank you as well for the position that you have, you know, uh, held. And thanks for all joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a fine weekend. Don't do any school. <laughs> <laughs> Never going to happen.